Hey, everybody, Holly here. Listen, I have to apologize up front for an error in today's show that happens multiple times, and it is all my fault. Uh, We, in the first segment of this show, talk about a tortoise who lives on St. Helena Island. I very authoritatively said it's St. Helena throughout the show, and Tracy followed suit because it was the one I researched. Uh, So instead of making our poor editor, Casey, edit in a whole new version of it, since we did not catch this until the show was edited together, I am just going to make this humble apology and hope that you will forgive me. And Every time you hear it, you can chuckle to yourself and know that I'm the reason it's wrong. Thanks! Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Tracy, it's finally the lighter episode I've been meaning to do. (laughs) I'm so happy for you. (laughs) Uh, This one was actually really fun. There's some consternation that happens in the middle act that I find humorous because it's just, in my opinion, silly. I don't want to denigrate anyone who doesn't find it silly, but I have reasons. We can discuss them in the behind the scenes. Um, We're going to talk about very old animals today. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Because a lot of these animals, when we say very old, we mean very old. Very, very old. Um, All of them, more than a hundred so much more. Um, and I thought they would be interesting to talk about because they've been, you know, marking time more or less unaware of all of the ups and downs and intrigues that humanity's been going through. Uh, and there's the stories that come out of this, I found as I was researching, are really about the way we as humans perceive these animals mm-hmm. and their importance or their their iconic status. Um I just want to note that we have this sort of, I don't know if I would call it bad luck, we have an uncanny repetition of events where we record a thing Mm -hmm. about something and then within a week, the circumstances of that thing change. Right. Two of the animals we're talking about are still alive. So please, <laughs> please, universe, do not do anything to these animals because we have recorded this episode. Uh, I'm not that superstitious, but we really do have an uncanny number of those yeah, instances. Yeah. Uh, one of them is already deceased, and its death made people real mad. So that's what we're talking about today. Very old animals and the way we think about them. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to start with Jonathan the tortoise, who is one of the most famous animals on this list because he is, as of when we're recording this, still alive. He offers a link back through time to a lot of events we have talked about on the show over the years. He's the oldest living land animal that we know of, and as of January 2022, also considered the oldest tortoise in history again that we know of. Yeah, it's not like they're submitting their birth certificates or records <laughs> to anyone. So there could be an older one out there that just hasn't been like, hello, I too saw the war. Um, <laughs> Jonathan's hatch date is reported as somewhere around 1832, although veterinarian Joe Hollins, who is his caretaker, has told news outlets that he thinks Jonathan could be even older. And the head of tourism for the island of St. Helena, which is where he lives, uh, that man is Matt Joshua. And he told CNN in 2022, quote, Jonathan could actually be 200 because the information regarding his arrival on the island is not exact and because there's no real record of his birth. So that hatch date of 1832 is a calculated guess based on when Jonathan first appears in the historical record, at which point he was already an adult, which would mean that he was at least 50 years old already. That appearance in the historical record is the moment that Jonathan, who had been captured in the Seychelles Island, which is where his species, the Seychelles giant tortoise, is native, that moment he was captured and brought to the home of Sir William Gray Wilson as a gift. That happened in 1882, so that 1832 date is just the result of subtracting 50 years from the date that the tortoise showed up as a gift. 
The record that denotes Jonathan's arrival is not any kind of official paperwork. It's just a letter that mentions him. There's also a photograph that shows Jonathan alongside several humans that was taken sometime between 1882 and 1886. And it's clear in that photograph that the tortoise is full grown. So there's some additional supporting evidence here, not just the letter. Yeah, we didn't uh, say so, but William Gray Wilson was the governor of St. Helena at the time. And there's been some confusion and debate over the years over Jonathan's exact age. Throughout the mid-20th century, there were a number of press mentions of a historic tortoise on St. Helena that made an interesting boast. So one of these I found in the Jersey Journal, which was tagged as a dispatch from St. Helena Island, and it read, quote, a giant land tortoise in the gardens of government house here is said to be the only creature alive that set eyes on Napoleon. The great general paced the paths of the gardens when in exile. Napoleon Bonaparte was exiled on St. Helena. It is the second place he was exiled, and it was where he died in 1821. So that is more than a decade before Jonathan is believed to have even been born. And it's more than 60 years before Jonathan arrived on St. Helena. So it appears this is a case of a giant tortoise who was there. Jonathan is not the only one that's been a gift over the years. For a while, it was kind of trendy to give giant tortoises as gifts. Uh, But it appears that there was one that was there when Napoleon was that is getting conflated or was at the time with Jonathan's story. A lot of newspapers reported this error as fact, although some of them seem kind of tongue-in-cheek about it, like the Daily Times of Davenport, Iowa, which uh, reported on the tortoise in a small blurb under the headline, Unique Distinction, in 1947. That write-up reads, quote, according to a newspaper item, there is a tortoise at St. Helena who probably saw Napoleon and, I might surmise, is the only one who hasn't written a book about it. St. Helena is part of the larger British overseas territory known as St. Helena, Ascension, and Tristan da Cunha. It's a tropical island in the South Atlantic that sits 2,500 miles east of Rio de Janeiro and 1,200 miles west of Angola. It's remote, and it's recorded as having been uninhabited when it was discovered on the feast day of St. Helena, May 21st, in 1502, by Spanish explorer João de Nova. That exact date is also contested because it's likely that it was actually discovered several weeks earlier. There's some supporting documentation that uh, hints at an earlier May date and that the reported date was selected to align with the name that they chose. But because of its isolated position in the Southern Atlantic, it stayed the exclusive knowledge of Portugal, for whom de Nova had been working when he found it. For a while... It took more than 80 years for English navigator Thomas Cavendish to land there after that. And once England knew about St. Helena, all of Europe kind of did, and it became essentially a port island. Its position made it a really good stopping point for ships on long voyages. The occupation of the island was claimed alternately by British and Dutch interests, but by the end of the 17th century, it was property of the British East India Company. For roughly 150 years after that, its population was split almost evenly between administrators of the British East India Company and their families and their enslaved workforce. Slavery was phased out on the island during the 1820s and 30s. In the 200 years since then, the island has continued to be a British territory, but it has gained some degree of self-governance. It's a relationship that has continued to evolve into the 21st century, The island has retained a small community. Only about 4,400 people live there. But despite the fact that it is pretty hard to get there, even with a relatively new airport that opened in 2016, it's a tourism destination. It's beautiful, and it has Jonathan. You can visit him. He's on my list. Jonathan is a Chelonian, meaning that he is in the order that includes tortoises, turtles, and terrapins. He is a Seychelles giant tortoise, as we said earlier. That's an animal that was actually used as a food source for a lot of years. Their own physiology was what made them so sought after for that reason. Not only have people found the meat from giant tortoises tasty, but their shells have made them easy to stack and store, particularly on sea voyages. And because they were so commonly eaten for so long... 
Jonathan is one of very few left, but he may be a specific subspecies of Seychelles tortoise. There are several such subspecies, some of which were thought to be extinct, and now we're like, maybe not. Uh, And as of a year ago, there had not been a conclusive determination regarding Jonathan and where he fits into the Chelonian order. Jonathan today lives what sounds like a pretty great life. He eats cabbage, carrots, apples, and bananas, as well as other plants and produce. Apparently, though, he does not like kale. His sense of smell is gone, and he's blind. He can still hear, though, and he's pretty sociable. He's very well cared for and seems to be still full of life. His weight is uncertain. There's not really an easy way to weigh him on the island. According to his keeper, Jonathan is still very interested in mating, and he has frequent rendezvous with two of the other tortoises on the island. Those are Emma and Fred. Fred, incidentally, was originally called Frederica and was believed to be female when the two were first introduced in the 1990s. It wasn't until 2017 when Fred had a veterinary procedure that they realized that he was male. Jonathan gets regular baths from Joe Hollins and is hand-fed, although Hollins has to wear welding gloves to do this because Jonathan's beak is very sharp. Could not be comfortable... (laughs) He could do a lot of damage if he clamped down on someone's finger. Yeah, and uh, again, he's blind, so he there's not necessarily uh, he he doesn't have vision to help him go after food. So the odds of a clamp on a finger are high. I think uh, Hollins has mentioned he's lost a couple fingernails over the years. Uh, Jonathan is part of a diverse group of animals that are kept on the island of St. Helena, and he's been a tourist attraction for a long time. In recent years, though, more rules have been instated to optimize Jonathan's health and ensure that he is not unduly stressed by all of his visitors and fans. For example, it was once allowed quite a number of years back for kids to sit on his back for photos. They don't allow that anymore. And now there is apparently pretty careful management of his interactions when tour groups come through because they can get a little bit raucous. In the decades that Jonathan has wandered within the grounds of the St. Helena governor's house, he has not always thrived. In the late 1960s, he was reportedly having some behavioral issues. An article that circulated in various papers read, quote, a protester has been disrupting the easygoing routine of civilized colonial life on the island of St. Helena, the British possession in the South Atlantic. Jonathan is the name, and Jonathan likes to upend benches beside the British governor's tennis courts and halt croquet games by sitting on the ball. Ordinarily, the governor of the island could not be expected to tolerate such boorish behavior, but Jonathan is special. I just, I, the the language of uh, civilized colonial life, I don't, I don't love that. I initially included an (laughs) insert that just said groan in this copy. (laughs) So this article continues by telling Jonathan's story and that he's 140 and that, quote, the governor decided the turtle was simply trying to let people know that he had had enough of the lonely life. Jonathan's mate met with an untimely death 100 years ago when she sauntered off a cliff. To remedy this problem, the governor ordered additional tortoises to keep Jonathan company. We're going to pause for a quick sponsor break, and then we'll talk about some modern efforts to improve Jonathan's health and well-being. When Hollins was initially hired to be Jonathan's veterinarian and caretaker, the elderly tortoise had a number of health issues, which were all traced back to nutrition deficiencies. With a change in diet to include more fresh fruits and vegetables, he bounced back and regained his health. You can read stories about how his beak was kind of crumbly, the the uh, nature of it was not very strong, and that it has really regrown and come back quite well. He does sometimes give visitors a scare that he has passed because apparently Jonathan likes to sunbathe, sprawling with his limbs and neck outstretched. Hollins also conducted a thorough review of the environment and protocols related to the care of the island's tortoises to make changes that would maximize the quality of life for Jonathan and his tortoise friends. Hollins told the Washington Post in 2022, quote, Jonathan is symbolic of persistence. 
endurance, and survival and has achieved iconic status on the island. Jonathan got a lot of news coverage in 2022 because St. Helena had a huge 190th birthday for him. They asked fans of Jonathan to send in video greetings wishing him happy birthday and any photos that tourists may have taken with him. This was all to be included in a celebration package for the event. He also got a cake made of salad as part of this three-day-long party. As part of the promotion for Jonathan's Big Day, the island's tourism pamphlet about the festivities noted just how much the world has changed while Jonathan has been living out his days there. Quote, he has watched more than 30 governors come and go from Plantation House, watched the island introduce radios, telephones, TVs, internet, cars, and an airport. He has lived through two world wars. NPR's coverage of the big birthday shindig also contextualized Jonathan's life on the historical timeline with some additional data points. They noted, quote, He's lived through two world wars, eight British monarchs, and 40 U.S. presidents. His lifetime has seen the first phone call, 1876, the first skyscraper, 1885, the first power-driven flight, 1903, the first people to walk on the moon, 1969, He was alive when the first photograph of a person was taken, 1838. Now he poses for selfies with adoring tourists. He was born before the creation of the postage stamp, 1840, and now appears on them. He's had the distinction of having met Queen Elizabeth II back when she was Princess Elizabeth. Yeah, that was in the 1940s. Uh, So that is Jonathan. Happy belated birthday, Jonathan. We hope you have many more. Um, The second oldest Chelonian on record, just incidentally, was a Madagascar-radiated tortoise named Tul Malila, who died at the ripe old age of 188 in 1965. Like Jonathan, he had been a gift, this time from Captain James Cook to the royal family of Tonga in the late 1700s. Moving on. In 2006, a team of researchers from Bangor University of Wales collected a number of Arctica islandica, also known as ocean quahogs, more casually just called clams, that was off the northern coast of Iceland. These quahogs come from a seabed that was 262 feet or 80 meters deep. The research project that the clams were part of was mounted to study the history of the oceans in relation to climate and the science of aging, because these clams are known to live for a really long time. As part of the collection process, the clams were frozen and opened, which kills them, and then the shells were removed for study. So here is a very quick and non-thorough rundown of clam anatomy and why the shell is important. Clams are bivalve mollusks. Their shells protect the soft muscles and organs inside. And those insides are actually pretty simple, but they're also very efficient. There's a hinge ligament that keeps the two shell pieces together and able to open, but there's also an adductor muscle that keeps the shell closed unless they need a little a little gap. There are gills for filter feeding and gas exchange. There's a heart. And there's also a muscular foot that extends out from between the shells to burrow into the seabed. And those shells are made of calcium carbonate. The mantle or outermost layer of the muscle secretes proteins and minerals that create a framework for the shell, which the calcium carbonate binds to as it is released. Anytime the animal grows, the outermost edge of the shell extends. And as each growth cycle completes, a ring is formed. So counting those rings enables scientists to gauge the age of the quahog, because some rings may be only subtly different from those adjacent to them, it's really necessary to look at these rings quite close up, thus the removal of the shells. So why are we walking through all of this? Well, when the Bangor team started studying the shell samples they collected back in the lab, they discovered that one of the quahog they had found was 405 years old. So the headlines that followed this called this the world's longest lived animal. Researchers named this quahog Ming because it had been born when the Ming dynasty ruled China. This was a record-breaking age. The oldest animal title had officially been held for two dozen years by another clam listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as 220 years old. 
But there was also another that wasn't in the Guinness Book, and that was one that was part of a collection of a German museum whose age was claimed to have been 374 when it was harvested. When the Times of London wrote about this discovery, it opened with, quote, a clam dredged alive from the bottom of the North Atlantic has been identified by scientists as the longest living animal ever known. Unfortunately, by the time its true age had been established, the 3.4-inch clam was already dead, but the British scientists who discovered it believed it could yield valuable information to help research into aging. The Times went on to explain that the team had received a 40,000-pound grant to use their finding in aging-related work by the charity group Help the Aged. In an interview with the BBC that published on October 28, 2007, Chris Richardson, a professor from Bangor University, explained, quote, What's intriguing the Bangor group is how these animals have actually managed, in effect, to escape senescence. That's growing old. One of the reasons we think is that the animals have got some difference in cell turnover rates that we would associate with much shorter-lived animals. He also explained how their work might map out the history of climate as it occurred during Ming's lifetime, saying, quote, the growth increments themselves provide a record of how the animal has varied in its growth rate from year to year, and that varies according to climate, seawater temperature, and food supply, And so by looking at these mollusks, we can reconstruct the environment the animals grew in. They are like tiny tape recorders, in effect, sitting on the seabed and integrating signals about water temperature and food over time. Almost as soon as the news went public of this record-breaking quahog, there was public outcry. People were angry that Ming had been killed as part of the research. The research team had explained in interviews and press releases that studying these clams could help humans understand the process of aging much more deeply in a way that could benefit humans. They had also stated that another goal of their ongoing work was to look at the last century of climate as it was reflected in these samples and then see if there was a significant difference to patterns of climate in the centuries that preceded it. But some people seem to think that the scientists had killed Ming knowing it was more than 400 because they wanted to study it further. That was completely incorrect. They had not been able to determine the quahog's age until after it was killed. The research group had no reason to think any of the collected clams were extraordinary. The Daily Telegraph of London ran an obituary for Ming, noting that it had grown from a larva when Queen Elizabeth I was still on the throne. This obit noted the various historical events that the clam had lived through, including the gunpowder plot, the Glorious Revolution. It also noted that by being an ocean floor dweller, Ming had been spared more unpleasant events like the potato famine, the plague, and World War II. On a completely different note of criticism, some questions arose about whether Ming could really be considered the oldest animal ever discovered, because there are coral that are older. But coral is made up of multiple individual corals that grow together to form the larger whole. So to sidestep any confusion and to clarify the claim, researchers started qualifying the superlative by saying that Ming was the oldest non-colonial animal not having anything to do with any colonialism, just colonies of animals. (laughs) In 2013, there was a recount. Uh, Really, this was an additional examination of Ming's shell, but researchers did once again count the bivalve's rings, this time using more advanced methods than had been available previously. This time, they discovered that Ming was a lot older than they previously calculated, 507 Uh, That would make Ming 34 when Queen Elizabeth I was born. Uh, Also a contemporary of figures like Christopher Columbus, Leonardo da Vinci would have been painting the Mona Lisa at the time. The team published their findings from this seven-year project in the periodical Paleogeography, Paleoclimatology, Paleoecology, In March 2013, that was in a paper titled Variability of Marine Climate on the North Atlantic Shelf in a 1357-year proxy archive based on growth increments in the bivalve Arctica Islandica. 
This paper details the historical ocean record that has been established through this study and notes that shells offer a unique opportunity to create such a record, and it describes their sample collection from seven years earlier. Quote, live specimens, dead articulated shells, and dead single-shell valves of A. Islandica were collected from the seabed during a cruise of the research vessel Bjarni Semensen in June 2006. The collection site of the shells used in this study was west of the island of Grimsey in a water depth of 81 to 83 meters. Live specimens were frozen on board and thawed and processed after return to the laboratory. So despite having explained the methods used across all the specimens in the study, uh, people were ready to be angry over this mollusk's death. We'll talk about the second wave of outrage after we hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Miss in History class going. Almost immediately after the team published their paper, news stories once again came out suggesting wrongdoing on the part of the research team, and it ignored the established information that they had not known they had such an old living specimen on board at the time that they collected and froze them. The Metro UK tabloid ran a story on November 13th of 2013 under the headline, Bungling Scientists Kill World's Oldest Creature, a Clam, After 507 Years in Sea. Oddly, this otherwise misleading article includes an actual quote from one of the researchers regarding the usefulness of the work that the study was doing regarding the science of aging. The Christian Science Monitor covered the story two days later with the headline, Scientists Discover World's Oldest Clam, Killing It in the Process. And this particular article also emphasized the clam's death, stating, but that is as old as Ming will ever get. CBS News wrote of the work the team was doing, quote, either way, Ming, an Arctica Islandica bivalve mollusk or ocean quahog, is still dead. And he could have been saved if they just counted the outside growth rings instead of the rings along the interior hinge ligament. An interview given to Science Nordic before this article ran which that CBS News story references, had explained why the interior was the best bet at the time of that first count. The hinge ligaments offered the best and most accurate information. They're not getting dinged around by other stuff in the ocean. Marine biologist Rob Vitbard told Science Nordic, quote, the age has been confirmed with a variety of methods, including geochemical methods such as the carbon-14 method. So I am very confident that they have now determined the right age. If there is any error, it can be only one or two years. Just a day after this tabloid story, the BBC ran one titled Clamgate, the Epic Saga of Ming, which walked readers through the initial discovery, the revision of the known age of the clam, and the level to which this entire story was misunderstood. One researcher mentioned that the team had gotten emails calling them clam murderers. But in that interview with the BBC that ran in November 2013, the research team pointed out that there was a double standard that their work faced amid the negative reactions, noting that, quote, the same species of clam are caught commercially and eaten daily. Anyone who has eaten clam chowder in New England has probably eaten flesh from this species, many of which are likely several hundred years old. Additionally, the chances are that there is an even older mollusk out there somewhere. Once these clams reach a certain age, they don't grow all that much each year, so a 500-year-old clam is not that different in size from a 200-year-old one. So it would be very easy to pick up one that is much, much older, not know it, and put it in chowder. Uh, You can now see Ming for yourself, if you wish, at the National Museum Cardiff, where its story and the science associated with it are integrated into the museum's Insight Gallery. Our last entry in this episode is short, but Holly was very tickled by it. This features a very old bird who is, as of when we are recording, still alive a blue and gold macaw named Charlie. Charlie is believed to have hatched in 1899, so she's 123 or 124, and she's known as Charlie the Cursor, sometimes also described as Winston Churchill's parrot, but that is contested. 
In January 2004, the Daily Mirror, so yes, another tabloid, ran a very colorful story about Charlie, catapulting her onto the international stage. I could not get my hands on that original article, but in it, all of the information was repeated in many other places, the claim was made that Charlie routinely uttered the phrases, blank Hitler, and blank Nazis, and that she had been taught those phrases with the word blank being replaced with an expletive by none other than her former owner, Sir Winston Churchill, and that when she said these things, she sounded exactly like Churchill. And Charlie's owner, a man named Peter Oram, stood by this claim and told news outlets repeatedly that his father-in-law, Percy Dabner, was a well-known dealer in birds and sold Charlie to the prime minister in 1937, and that then when Churchill died in 1965, Charlie was returned to the Croydon pet shop she had come from. Today, she's part of Heathfield Nurseries, which is owned by Oram, and employees of the nursery have also gone on record repeating that same story. Here is the problem. Churchill's country estate, known as Chartwell, is now part of the National Trust, and as such, it has a staff that retains the historical records of the property and the Prime Minister's time there. And they have found no evidence, despite a lot of digging, it sounds like, that Charlie was ever Winston Churchill's bird. The New York Times did some digging into the matter and spoke with Judith Seward, who worked at Chartwell and was its marketing manager and head of visitor services at the time. Her statement to the press was this, quote, Sir Winston had a variety of livestock and once owned a budgerigar. That's a budgie, if any of you <laughs> have, like, pet birds. Uh, I didn't recognize it as a budgie by, by the word. Uh, he also had a completely different kind of parrot some years previously, but Lady Soames is absolutely certain that this macaw was not her father's. Seward also had the possibility, it seemed kind of like a peacemaking move, that the macaw might have belonged to someone on staff at Chartwell rather than Churchill. The Lady Soames referenced there was, as the quote indicated, Churchill's daughter, the author Mary Soames, She told the BBC in 2004, quote, Before the war, we did have an African gray for about three years, but that's quite, quite different from a macaw. It's smaller or more compact with a sort of red face. It never came to London. It may well have gone back, for all I know, to the person my father got it from, but it was the end of the parrot's relationship with my father. So by her account, there was not a bird in the Churchill household while her father was prime minister. Definitely none that he kept until his death. She also gave her opinion on the claim that her father might have taught a bird to curse Nazis, saying it was, quote, too tiresome for words. And although the mirror claimed that Charlie was famed for cursing in front of visitors, there's no actual evidence of the bird cursing at all, other than people's words. Charlie has been visited by various journalists over the years, hoping to catch a recording of her famously inappropriate language. I think the most recent one I found was from 2014. But she seems to mostly just give a croaky squawk. She is a very mature lady and say just a few benign words, including hello and goodbye. Uh, we accidentally have a theme in what we're recording this week because the next thing we're going to record also has a lot of things that it's like different people or different publications reporting the same inaccurate thing. Yeah. Oof. Oof. The old animals. Okay, my first listener email is from our listener, Holly Fry, who has a correction. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's a minor correction, and it's actually kind of a like, uh, I'm not sure. I think it was in the behind the scenes that I mentioned that Thomas Hicks, who was the winner of the 1904 Olympic marathon, despite having been poisoned, um, didn't run again, to the best of my knowledge. Like, I had seen a mention of him where it was like, he did not do any more running after that. Uh, But then I was just reviewing stuff recently uh, that I had had in relation to that episode to make sure I hadn't missed any in the sources list. And I saw a thing from Runner's World, and that suggested that he did keep running for a while and then moved to Canada. But I didn't find backup on that either. So just FYI, I I may have made a false statement about his his running career. Um, (laughs) 
and then I have a, a listener mail from our listener, Anna, but she mentioned something that I believe we have talked about on the show. It's also related to the marathon. Uh, Anna writes, thank you for so many wonderful episodes. The excellent 1904 marathon one inspired me to mention the delightful coverage of the 1912 Stockholm Olympics in the Jim Thorpe bio uh, path lit by lightning. I think you mentioned that when we talked about Jim Thorpe or you used it, but I'm not positive. I don't immediately recall. Uh, author, have, author David Moranis includes the exaggerations and poor performance of rich kid George S. Payton to modern pentathlon, such a weird event, including being dosed with opium before the 4,000 meter run. Have a great day. I don't have any cats, so I'm including a photo of the kittens my friend Sherry is currently fostering. Okay, kitten pictures are like weapons grade cute to me. I'm <laughs> powerless in front of them. Thank you so much, Anna. I, it is really, really interesting when you start looking back at Olympic sports. And I know it's still an issue where, you know, doping is still something that's constantly a uh, concern and investigated. But like, I just, I don't know, uh, you know, the idea that opium and strychnine would be performance mm-hmm. enhancers continues to blow my mind. So I just, every time I think about it, it's like my brain has like this clicking thing where it can't quite reset because it just seems so wrong. I know, we'll poison people. That'll make them run faster. Je m'excuse. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> if you would like to write to us, especially if you have foster kitten pictures, but you don't have to, uh, you could do that at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can also find us on uh, the internet on all of the social medias as Missed in History. And if you have not subscribed to the podcast, but you think that might be a fun thing to do, you can do that on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere you listen to your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.